Ram asked me to give uh, the 12 grand challenges of sustainable development. They're not really of the pithy Hilbert variety, uh, but I am identifying what I think are the 12 big, big problems. First is to identify what are the real barriers or boundaries to economic growth right now. There are lots of people in the world who believe growth needs to be stopped completely uh, because of ecological boundaries. Uh, there are, of course, others who say that's absurd. And the truth is we don't really know. And of course, a lot of it depends on technological decoupling. To what extent is it possible to have what we would measure or call economic growth or economic progress without uh, requiring more primary resource use? Second is identifying pathways for the world's toughest regions. Uh, sustainable development, in my view, is not a global average. It is that every region of the world needs an answer. So if there's one region, say, God, you know, I have a great theory. I don't know what the hell to do with the Sahel. You know, that's uh, 200 to 300 million people. I mean, it's devastating, terrible. But for the rest, it's fine. That's not a great theory, actually. So we need a theory in which every region of the world has an approach. And many do not right now. These are places I spend a lot of time. And I dare you to stand in the middle of Mali and come up with a great, convincing development strategy. Of course, you can have some ideas. But it ain't easy, because it's not just simply saying, well, get your institutions right, enforce the rule of law, and so forth. That's all fine, but it's actually not going to develop the Sahel, which is without infrastructure, without education, without income, without transport, without primary energy resources other than possibly solar, which could be vast in the key, and so forth. The Congo Basin, Central Asia, Afghanistan, for example, frontier provinces of Pakistan, lots of South Asia. Each region needs an answer. Some really are about governance. A lot are about endowments of primary resources. And often there are hundreds of millions of people involved. Third challenge is how do we secure the gender and minority rights that are part of international law but are not observed. Challenge four is what are the efficient or effective investments to ensure cognitive and physical development of all young children? This may seem obvious, but it is not obvious. The stunting rates of young rural children in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa are nearly 50%. And some Scientists say to me, there's no way those children are going to get out of stunting using locally produced food. There's just not enough meat, dairy, proteins, and so forth in what can be managed locally. I don't know whether that's true, but that is a view of some very, very serious senior nutritionists. I take the challenge very seriously, so I raise this as a fourth area. Fifth problem that I believe is solvable that we're working hard on is creating an effective primary health system that costs less than $100 per capita per year. Our system is $8,000 per person per year in the US, just to give you a metric. But in sub-Saharan Africa, often governments are spending $15 per person per year because they have very little money. And maybe they could mobilize $30 per person per year. We need low-cost, effective health systems. I'm a believer that information technology can enable a lot of breakthroughs, but they, it, has to be defined, it has to be designed and mobilized. OK, challenge number six, a big one, low-carbon energy for all. We had a meeting of this network last week, and a leading expert from China one of their top energy experts and one of their key negotiators gave a wonderful seminar, wonderful. And he said, look, here's our trajectory. Here are our technology options. There isn't one of them that comes close to the two degree centigrade target. We want to grow, but none of these can lead to decarbonization in the time period that's allotted. 
What should we do, he said. It was a challenge. So I've looked at proposals for decarbonizing China. They're incredibly underdeveloped. Hand-waving in the most part. Very serious questions like mass uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Great, there isn't one demonstration project now, but some people say, OK, 80% CCS for fossil fuel plants by 2050. Could be true, but how will we even know on the trajectory that we're on right now? Completely impossible. So we don't have a sequence of research, plans, demonstrations, trials, even to identify what this pathway might be. And the same, of course, is true in the US. It's unbelievable that in a decade, we weren't able to get one proper CCS demonstration program up and running, the so-called future gen, which died a political death, along with so many other things in this country. Challenge number seven, sustainable smallholder agriculture of a productivity level sufficient to feed the population, and at the same time with greatly reduced environmental impact. Agriculture remains the number one anthropogenic sector in the world. Not automobiles, not industry, agriculture. That's where the deforestation, the invasive species, the methane, nitrous oxides, uh, lots of the uh, carbon emissions, biodiversity uh, loss, Habitat destruction is taking place in the agriculture sector. So what do we do? Very interesting, tough problems. What do we do about nitrogen runoff, which is massive, which dominates the natural nitrogen cycle now from the reactive nitrogen that we put on the ground? Nobody has yet convincing answers, though there's some very interesting models uh, and ideas about uh, agroecology that might work. Protecting major ecosystems that are under stress, starting with the oceans, from ocean acidification, but also overfishing uh, and uh, other destruction of uh, marine habitats, glacier retreat, drainage of wetlands often to turn into urban areas, massive urban pollution, deforestation of the rainforest, overgrazing of the pasturelands, massive soil and land erosion, and the estuaries, 130 major estuaries in the world, almost all of them eutrophied by nitrogen and phosphorus runoff right now that leads to algal blooms and hypoxia in the estuarial systems, including Chesapeake Bay. Challenge number nine, a toolkit for urban sustainability. We saw how New York City, but also Bangkok, Beijing, and others have been unable to withstand the huge storms and sea surges. And there's much more to come. Sea levels could rise substantially this century. Nobody knows the dynamics of the ice sheets and other uh, sources of, uh, of, of uh, sea level rise. Sustainable mining and land use practices, in, especially in poor countries where Corporate behavior is often massively destructive to local communities and to the ecosystems. And so I think there needs to be a special focus on the behavior of the extractive industry sector. And incidentally, one part of that is that if you're in a poor country and some company is absolutely ripping up the rainforest or seizing farmland, and then you try to find out where is that company based, Nine times out of 10, it's based in the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or some tax haven with completely anonymous ownership. So we've invented a system of sheer illegality and irresponsibility. And it's the easiest thing in the world uh, that, uh, to, to operate in lawlessly. And this is part of the, the challenge. Design efficient and equitable standards for the global commons. What are the right standards? The world's not been able to agree on them. I think a right to development is number one in my view. It can't be that the rich world says to the poor world, sorry, 
we didn't get this quite right. There's no room for you. You'll wreck the planet. A norm that is a, 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 an ethical norm of convergence, that the world is aiming towards shared, similar responsibilities, living standards, ability to tap technologies, and so forth, that everybody understands it's not only room for development, but expectation that we're all going to end up at a similar level of material use and material well-being. Third, polluter pays principle. That is to internalize externalities. Fourth, accepting historical responsibility for long-lasting pollutants like CO2. Fifth is predictable aid systems. Don't get me started. Very tough. Sixth is a predictable global assessments for global public goods. And seven would be SDGs with targets and milestones. And finally, uh, challenge number 12 I've already mentioned is redesigning corporate governance, what it means. Corporate social responsibility is a start, but it's only a small start. The whole corporate sector has run off the rails of political accountability. The corporations own the governments more than the governments control the corporations. And we've created a system of gaps in the world like the tax havens that absolutely amplify this irresponsibility. We need to close the tax havens with all respect to the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands. It should not be the main location in the world for China's outward foreign investment. We don't think money laundering should be the basic standard for how the world economy is organized. Mitt Romney can find some other bank for his money. Uh, we should close these tax havens. We should enforce accountability for externalities. No lobbying, no campaign financing. This is my reverie. Uh, and uh, pricing of all externalities. That would go a very long way. I love the corporate sector uh, in the true sense that big companies are the most effective organizations in the world. Their technologies are absolutely critical. They are the most globalized institutions in the world. We have a lot to learn from them, and we have a lot to uh, find solutions with the companies, because they're basically the only organizations in the world that act at scale of uh, 150 to 200 countries. So they're really good, but they shouldn't run the world's politics. That's where we have gone wrong. They should have a huge role in the world's business, and they should clean up after themselves and stop telling Congress and the President what to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.